Today, it's all about photography artified on Behind the Shot. Hi, welcome to Behind the Shot. I'm Steve Brazel, the host, and this is the show where we try and get inside the mind of great photographers by taking a closer look behind one of their shots from conception to completion, all those stories and challenges that happen in between. And today's guest I am so excited about that I actually forgot to hit record, and this is like the seventh take at this point. Before we get into the guest, let me just let you know that I have a brand new announced uh, class that's coming up. It's a live remote, it's COVID time, right? A live remote learning workshop through Princeton Photo Workshops. And their website is princetonphotoworkshop.com. Workshop.com, not an S at the end of that. And it's going to be three consecutive nights or three consecutive weeks, one night per week, coming up in April of 2021. So if you want to know more information about it, Head over to the website, PrincetonPhotoWorkshop.com. The link to that, by the way, is on all of my websites, whether it be SteveBrazel.com or the website for the podcast, which is BehindTheShot.tv. Speaking of which, if you are a podcast listener and you like to listen to your podcasts in a podcast catcher app, Behind the Shot is available in audio-only format and video format wherever you get your podcast. That is assuming the service you use or the app that you use supports video, so check that out. If it doesn't, you can always go over to YouTube. And on YouTube, the video is there. And please, wherever you go, do subscribe to the app. If it's on YouTube, hit the bell. It's amazing how you can subscribe and still not be notified when I do something like the live image critique shows or something, unless you've clicked the bell. And that brings us up to uh, our guest today for like the fourth time. And, and I so apologize to Karen Hutton. Karen, how are you? <laughs> I'm just fine. This is fun. I'm glad somebody else uh, does stuff like this because I do. So, <laughs> it, it's so weird that I, we just went through a whole intro and I forgot to hit record in my oh video Oh my God, software. you guys, it was so awesome. You wouldn't believe how and good And it we will were. never be that good again. So <laughs> let's, let's, um, let's do this over again. Karen Hutton is kind of somebody who does everything. Photographer, speaker, educator, and one that intrigued me that I knew about when I first heard about you probably four or five years ago a VO artist and a VO artist does voiceovers and you do everything, commercial voiceovers, industrial voiceovers. I'm kind of curious why voiceovers? What got, cause your voice is soothing. It's relaxing. What got you into VO? Well, see, you say it's soothing and relaxing. It's just my voice to me. I have no idea, but I got yeah. into voiceover because I was an actor um, for many, many years so I think I've been doing voiceovers maybe 20 years, but I'm not sure because it was kind of an overlap, you know, with the acting career and then I quit acting and then there was a little gap and then I started voiceover on my own with home studios and stuff after that. So I think it's about 20 years I've been doing it. Well, see, and voiceovers um, that's have how changed I got so it. much. Pardon me? It used to be, you know, you I, I would have to drive to LA or Burbank to a studio and now everybody's got a booth at home with a good mic and... And it's, you know, amazing what people can do. And a lot of people process their own. They don't even submit a raw file. They even add compression and de-essing and deplosive and et cetera, et cetera. So I, I, I am curious. Your voiceover art, your delivery has, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Your delivery has, I, I said soothing or relaxing before. Your delivery and voiceover has that kind of calming effect. And I see that in your photography. Oh, that's right? interesting. Yeah, that makes do sense. You, do you see the connection? I, I do, actually, especially since... So I, I don't know what, what all you know about me, but I um, created a, a series of retreats and workshops called The Artist's Voice. Um, and I have an ebook, find, you know, Finding Your Artistic Voice in Photography. Not that I'm trying to plug it. My point is that because of teaching voice for 25 years, when I got into photography or back into photography, because that's a whole other story, people started asking me, how do I do what I do? And I think that must have been, I didn't know that at the time, but I think now that must have been what they were sensing. And they're like, how do you do that? And I'm thinking, how do I not do that? Because it's my voice. It's how I see the world. So artistically speaking, a voice is is your point of view. It's your take on the world. It's your, you know, it's you embedded into the pixels of your images. And, and so, I refer yeah. to photographers a lot of times as, you know, be true to your own voice because mm -hmm. that's really what it is. And with what you shoot, 
And I mean, you get, you know, macro and wide and et cetera, but mainly it's fine art landscapes, nature photography, travel photography. And to me, that whole voice thing, there is a common thread in how I hear you yep. and the work that I see. And I, I always used to make the, the argument that somebody that's really good at one sport quite often will be, they may not be as good, but they quite often can pick up any other sport and have fun with it and do better than the average person because there's a common thing. And I think the same thing is true of artists, really good artists take that, that have found their voice. And I think that's one of the big, the big paths in learning photography is being able to not only find your voice, but trust it. Right. <laughs> yeah. And I think that carries through other art. Um, I mean, do you agree? Oh, absolutely. I'm sitting here smiling and nodding because I'm like, yes, I agree with everything you're saying. Absolutely. You have you have a quote on your website. I warned Karen I was going to use this quote. <laughs> but when I saw this quote, I literally went, oh, my God, that's awesome. Right. Photographer, voice. I guess start over. Photographer, voice, purveyor of awesomeness. <laughs> That's Karen Hutton, right? That That is everything about Karen Hutton, and it explains why you have reached the levels in the photography world, voiceover world too, but why you've reached the levels that you have in photography. You are a professional Fujifilm ex-photographer. Explain that. Um, well, basically, I'm a, you know, a partner with Fujifilm, kind of like a brand ambassador, and um, you know, some of us some people work with Canon, Explorers of Light, and with Nikon, they have the, I forget what their title is. Ours is X hyphen photographer. And, um, and I partner with Fujifilm on projects and launches and all kinds of things. Which, okay. You mentioned Canon Explorers of Light, which I've had a bunch on, and I haven't had uh, a Fuji ambassador, as it were, before. And mm -hmm. I'm excited because uh, personally, I love the pictures that I see from Fuji cameras. There's something about the, I don't know how to describe it. There's almost a 3D color effect that I see come yeah, out of Fuji's, right? like out of camera. It's wild. Yeah. yeah. So let's talk about galleries and, and exhi uh, exhibitions for a minute. You've had multiple multiple gallery showings or exhibitions in California. Google's Moments That Matter, you were mm -hmm. in. Uh, Fuji Film Ambassador Gallery in New York. They have their own gallery in New York. That's kind of cool. So I didn't know how to frame that because basically what that is, is pretty much any time they do... Um, a short-term gallery, and they do them for just different reasons, you know. Um, and they're galleries, but they're short, so they're not they're not a pop up, but they'll be for an event right. or they'll be for a an exhibition, it, a period of time. And so, yes, I've been in a number of those. Is that the same for the one in Tokyo, Japan? No, that's different because that is their part of their head, headquarters, and they do have an actual gallery oh. there. So that I don't know, like how a long permanent the work display is type thing. Yeah, yeah, they do. Okay. Uh, educator speaker, your voice has to lean into this one too, because you have spoken for Photoshop World, our friend Scott Kelby, uh, Photo Expo Plus. By the way, let me just say for, for Photoshop World, Scott is doing some killer stuff online right now. So even with COVID, my gosh, go check out Kelby One because they've really got, they've got all kinds of live stuff online and I'm a big fan of, of you Kelby know, Kelby So One. I did the landscape conference that they oh, did you? these little mini conferences. Yeah. So I did the landscape conference and then they've got a travel conference coming up in January and I'm part of that as well. So yeah, definitely check it out because it has the look and feel and all the awesome flavor of a Photoshop world. I don't know how they managed to do that, but it's you know, really cool the way they're doing it online. Uh -huh. What amazes me about Kelby is one of the biggest things is companies reaching a level where they can't pivot. And regardless of size, Scott has managed to figure, okay, can't do Photoshop world because of COVID, pivot. Just like that. It's amazing. Uh, you've spoken for uh, Google. You've done photographer talks at Google. You've been on Smug Mug Live with Alistair Jolly, who I think people know him because he does Smug Mug Live, and people may know him because he's the global marketing manager for Flickr and Smug Mug. What they don't know is... Alistair is an amazing landscape photographer too. He's been on the show before. Great guy. It's check out Smug Mug Live. I think it's Smug Mug Films on, on YouTube. Uh, you've been on The Grid, Scott Kelby again. You've been on Twit, uh, Focus on Photography with, again, mutual friend Ant Pruitt, uh, one of the nicest guys on earth. Candid oh, Frame. He's phenomenal. A Barry Nix. 
-hmm. Valerie Jardin, who's been on the show before. You've been on Hit the Streets. Mm -hmm. um, so you've got street cred, as it were. <laughs> but when we were going I, I back and forth. I think of it as street tread. Street <laughs> Yes, don't we all? Don't I've got, we all? <laughs> I've got a lack of street tread, yeah. When we were emailing back and forth, picking the image that we were going to discuss today, I made a comment. You said to me, what is it you're looking for? What do you see in my photos? And here's basically what I said about how I see Karen's photography work. It's kind of by the way, the way you do voiceovers too, but that's a different story. My description of Karen's work is it's more than a photo. It's some of the best use of space, actual space in composition that I've ever seen. Your sense of space, your tech, technical excellence that you have. Um, there are a lot of fine art photographers out there, and I'm not trying to take away from any of them. There are some amazing ones, but it's rare to see photographic visuals, right? communicated almost therapeutically to me. And, and I made I've the never comment heard my work described that way before, by the way, which actually taught me a lot. And I'm kind of humbled by that description, actually. But but, but do you see it, though? I mean, it's hard to look at your own work that way, but it's relaxing, it's inviting, it's minimalistic, but yet has kind of a focused draw to it. Do you understand what I mean? Absolutely. Yeah. I've thought a lot about it. it. Just didn't think of it quite that way. So it's interesting to see what I did think about and how it came across, because you never really know as an artist. You don't know how you're going to come across. No, with this. that is true. And and here's the other thing. When I look at your work, when I when I talk about space, right, and, and you having this command to me of space, it's a pregnant pause. It's hearing you think, right? It's all those things that you would do in a VO job, but you do it visually better than almost anybody. So- I, I want to talk about your work and ask a couple questions about your work, okay? Okay. Your images have an amazing color. Part of that may be the color profile that comes out of the Fuji. Some of it may be, you know, what you do regardless. Even your black and white images have an amazing, you know, air quotes, color to them. How did you learn to see the world the way that you do? Whoa, <laughs> I'm already speechless. <clears throat> I ask a lot of questions, and I always have. I have a friend who says I ask more questions than his five-year-old. Um, and I ask them of myself as well. So I was aware at an early age that I saw the world very differently. I had a vision when I was young that informed the way I see the world and the way I live and what I, the things I know to be true. I became aware pretty early on that I see different levels of reality. Um, and they all. Interest. Oh, okay. Yeah. So my next they all question play. is that. They all play. Sorry. My next question is literally that you get abstracts, you get unique angles and interpretations of scenes that I I'm embarrassed to say, I just don't see, right? I could walk down the street. I can see this happening. You and me walking down the street and you stop to photograph something. And I'm like, what is Karen photographing? You see these, you see these angles, these abstract assemblies of shape. Do you have to look for those like normal people or do they jump at you? You know, it kind of depends on the, we all have different zones. You know, if I'm, hauling hauling butt to the store and I got stuff on my right. mind. I'm not going to see those things. If I go out with a camera in my hand and if I were to verbalize, which I don't in my own head, but if I were to verbalize some of the stuff that goes on in my head, <laughs> it's a little scary sometimes. But it'd be stuff like like I talk to my gear, I talk to my lenses, and I talk to the day. I talk to who, where I'm going. So look, if I'm walking down, you know, Primrose Lane, I say, so, hi, what you got going on? You know, I literally lead with a question. Why is that important? Now, I didn't do this on purpose for this reason. I had to kind of, um, a lot of the things I know to be true, I had to, what do you call it, retrofit or retro explain. But when you ask your mind a question, 
it's hardwired to want to answer it. Right. So aside from the rules of take your time and um, don't, you know, slow down and all that kind of stuff, I would say I ask questions. What are you about? You know, what, what do you have today? What's your story? You know, and on and on and on. I sound like a crazy person, but that actually because no, I get no, answers. No, you don't. And here's the thing. This, my friends, right here is why I forgot to hit record. Okay? <laughs> this is this is I it. scared him. And here's the thing. Um, I've been in radio for, you know, almost 40 years or about 40 years. And when I went to work in Detroit, uh, it was because my brother-in-law was very, very well known in radio and television in Detroit. His name was Robin Seymour. If you see any of the old little Stevie Wonder clips with Stevie Wonder playing harmonica and cheerleaders sitting on the ground, that's Robin's TV show. And <clears throat> Robin was telling me when I was studying voiceovers early, he was telling me a story of Casey Kasem, where Casey was asked, how do you do, how do you make these voiceovers sound like, uh, you know, so special when it's such an average product? And the answer was, I imagine I've never seen it before. You know, so taking that and extrapolating, imagine, yeah, okay, it's shoes. But imagine if you've never seen shoes before, oh my God, they, I, no more stub toes, no more blisters, no more rocks that I'm walking on. And that to me is what you just described exactly. It's, it's a way of looking at that Primrose Lane like you've never seen it before, even if you have. Yeah, it's like... You could say soft fascination. It's a mental set. It's a me totally a mental set. It's like soft fascination, a sense of wonder, um, a sense of curiosity. You have to get what, what I call a kindergarten mind, which is one that oh, has like no that. assumptions and doesn't know all the answers. You know, and, I, and I've always photographed that way. And I'll tell you what, what it does sometimes is we used to do a lot of photo walks. Do you remember in Google Plus days? Oh, yeah. Loads and the of early photo. Flickr days too. Yeah, exactly. And it was wonderful because we, you know, the community would all get together. And so I was on a photo walk in California on the on the ocean, <clears throat> and I had an idea for a shot. And we were all standing kind of close together, and I had my camera on the tripod, and I was thinking this was before anybody. Well, I don't know anybody knew who I was, but I mean, I was still pretty. I felt anonymous. Of course, I still feel anonymous, but whatever. Anyway, so I'm sitting there thinking about the shot, and I'm looking at my camera, and I'm. I know what I want, but I'm thinking about the setting and I'm like, but if I, you know, which ones do you play against each other to get whatever effect? Right. And I'm, I'm just kind of going through that process. And a guy standing next to me reaches over to my camera and goes, here, I, here, this is what you want. Let me fix this for you. Yeah, that happened. And I was like, huh, why? Thank you, you freak. Anyway, yeah, really. so, um, <laughs> Yeah, he reached over and made the adjustment on my camera for me. And then, I mean, to his credit, I just called him a freak, and I don't even remember his name. But um, at a subsequent photo walk, he came up to me and he said, I just looked you up and looked at your work. And he goes, I just want to say I'm really sorry. And I said, that's okay. Well, and there are people I know that are world-class photographers that don't understand tech at all. And quite, quite honestly, they know what to set on their camera for them. They don't necessarily understand what it means. I mean, it happens. You just touched on something, though, that flashes me back to an email you sent. You made a comment in an email that you sent that Fujifilm gear, as a, you know, Fujifilm ambassador, as it were, it factors into how you see and shoot. Yep. Extrapolate. Well, so... <clears throat> Wow. Okay. That's, or is that's it deep. not answerable? Maybe, maybe it's. It is answerable. It's I don't just, know. I'm, I'm trying to think of the answer in this amount of time when it's really that amount of time. But essentially, I don't. For for one thing, one easy easy answer is I don't have to work nearly as hard to get the final result I want based on the photograph that comes out of the camera. It's much closer. I can make it much closer in camera. I will always post process, but you know. And so the and is the key part. So that's a, a great part right there all by itself. But the and is that it's so versatile and it sees color and tone and micro contrast the way I like to see them. And it gives me ideas 
because I can, you know, take it places I couldn't take other cameras because of I could shoot in lower light. It's stable, you know, all that right. stuff. Um, you know, back back when I first started being able to do more of that, you know, now all cameras can do a lot of that stuff. But back then it was pretty unique. And um, it just made me curious to know what else it could do. And that's a good thing for me because when I'm, oh, what if we try this? What if we try that? And it comes back and says, hey, why don't you try this? So when your gear talks back to you, you know, right. well, that, you got it triggers it triggers inspiration, which brings Correct. us to the shot. Okay. Because again, I'm going to stress this, folks, the, the lower third is popping up under Karen if you're watching the video and if you're watching the audio. Make sure that you go to the website, BehindTheShot.tv, find this episode, even if it's in the past archives, you know, scroll down and find it. And uh, all the links, you know, for, for Karen are there. Uh, multiple websites, social media, the book that she mentioned, all of that is in the show notes over at BehindTheShot.tv. This shot, when we started talking, we were like, do you want to go, you know, the the strict photography end? Do you want to do more the artified end? And I've never really done on this show a shot like this. Uh, <laughs> what's the title of this image? Um, uh, uh, Forest by Enlightenment. I love it. So you called this to me artified. Yes. And that's perfect. It's a photograph. When I first look at it, I'm not even sure which I see first, right? I don't know if I'm seeing the artified mindset first or if I'm seeing the photograph because I see the photograph in this, right? It's there. It's obvious to me. And I'm going to try and describe this for people on the audio feed. And I say this probably every time, but I'm going to stress it this time. There is no way in hell I'm going to describe this shot right. So... <laughs> Just go to the website, BehindTheShot.tv, or go watch the video in your podcast app or on YouTube. There's no way you're going to get what I'm saying here. You're just not. But here's what I'm going to try. It's a tree tunnel. So think, think tree tr tunnel. If you've ever been to Kauai, they have a famous tree tunnel on Kauai. It's kind of that look, except the trees are not curling in to touch at the top like a normal tree tunnel. They're just big, tall trees that go up, and the canopies happen to touch. But that tree tunnel is mixed with an artistic, almost painterly effect. But I don't mean painterly like, you know, okay, paint plug in and it puts brush strokes on it. Not that. It's it's almost mystical and fairy-like in what it does. There's a pathway going down. It looks like a dirt pathway. It's not like a road. The roots of the trees come out into the pathway. There's a bright light shining between the trees about two thirds of the way down the pathway. But past that, it's not like you see in a lot of shots where the very end is this bright white light. Hey, you know, don't look at the light, Carol Ann type thing. <laughs> this one, you see trees at the end, which is awesome. Left and right is symmetrical. The greens are vibrant. Again, think painterly in that sense. The yellows, even there's some blue mixed in with the light that's coming through that almost tells you time of day. Um, and here's the thing, there are layers of atmosphere in this shot, from things floating to the light peeking through the trees to the color usage. This is fine art done right to me, right? This is how it should be done. So this was shot on a Fujifilm camera? Yes, it was. What was it? Uh, I believe it was an X-T2. Okay. And... I'm going to look here really quick and just see if there's something. No, it's not. Okay. I was wondering if I had EXIF data on this shot, and I don't. So this this is a real landscape shot, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. So you go out and you take a landscape shot that a million people have done of trees and a path and light shining through. Mm -hmm. let's, let's start with your concept of where this thing ended up because it's completely different. When you took the photo... Did you know in your head that you were going to make this type of conceptual art? No. I knew that. So this is uh, the forest of Fontainebleau um, at the Palace of Fontainebleau at the, uh, in Paris, outside of Paris in France. Okay. And the day was magical. We, rode, we took the train to the town. We rode rented bikes and rode the bikes all over the, the place. Ended up in this forest that 
because I was with a friend and we were both completely taken with it. And it was like being transported somewhere and the light and inc- everything was incredible. So of course I wanted to move in and never leave because it was incredible. <clears throat> and I did my best to take the kind of image that felt the way I felt. Fujifilm helps because the, you know the colors and everything it comes across the way it should. And and yeah, I love Fuji's the, color implementation is. Yeah. I don't want to use I'm the word film, vibrant. Yeah, I'm a film girl, and they their engineers were film people, so they've tr- managed to translate that better okay. than anyone. So anyway, um, yeah, I mean, I loved the photo and everything. But not even but. I really loved it. But I kept coming back to it and going, it was just so magical. It was so magical. It was so magical. And then the end of last year, um, before actually before COVID hit, I kind of hit a place in myself where I won't go into all that. But my big question was, what next? What's next? What's next? And I just kept hearing it over and over again. And I was like, I really need the, the art thing had which was why I started photography was for fine art just really needed to happen. And I was like, well, what does it look like? What is this thing? What is it that's pushing? You know, it was like somebody just nagging all the time. What do you want? I said, and this wasn't my very first shot, but I had played around with procreate on the iPad for a while. Oh, and um, I started to, I experimented digitally on, you know, in Photoshop and with plugins and with things like that. But Pro, I kept coming back to Procreate because of what you can do with it. And I thought of all the shots, I did a couple, but this was, I think, the first one I really decided to redo completely as a painting on, in, in Procreate. So I painted over it. I painted, no, you don't really paint over it. You actually choose brushes. And I bought, I have a lot of brushes and I do a lot of this now. Um, but this one, I wanted to see if I could transport it so it it looked way more the way it felt um, and the way I feel about these moments. So I painted it. I literally use these really cool brushes and it pushes, it does things to the pixels of the image itself. Um, so are you using an Apple pencil when you do this? Yeah, I use an Apple pencil when I do it. And so okay. I read, I went over the whole thing and then painted over on top of the leaves. So I made my own leaves and... Um, what did I, what else did I add? I added like, I did add some atmosphere because it was there. It just, I wanted it to be even more palpable because I wanted the particles in the air and I wanted the leaves. So I, you know, I added the leaves that float and things that float. But you did something with the light too, because yep. this is a, and again, if you're listening on audio, dude, what's up? Go look at the video, please. Right. But you, this is a, this is a classic landscape shot. Yeah. I mean, let's start there. This is a classic landscape mm-hmm. shot, except it's not. Right. And you manage to work the light. It's one of the yes. things I love about this shot, actually. Mm-hmm. You manage to work the light in a way, and you're using color as light from yep. lights to dark. You're using color. Normally, you would dodge and burn a photo like this to create to create a situation where you're directing the viewer's eye. Well, you're doing that here with both light and color and effect, which is neat, right? I'm assuming this was all natural light, by the way. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay. So knowing your work, I'm guessing that the actual photo out of camera, a normal photo, was absolutely amazing. But the post work here. The post work, yeah. So I mean, it was it was good, but even now I look at it and I go, yeah, this is this is what the image really wanted to be in the first place. And I'll tell you that once I'm done in Procreate, I do take it into Photoshop and I do use I use plugins. I do I use Photoshop techniques also, but I also use plugins which help help me pick up um, even more of the specific. And I use color channels and you know, lightning and saturations. And so I control the actual colors and levels and saturations and luminance and all that individually. So I get pretty granular with it all. Any, um, any favorite plugins? I love, um, exposure five, which is now exposure six, and it will be something bigger in the future (laughs) when you hear this down the line, but the exposure line of software uh, really works well for me as does the Nick collection 
parts of the Nick collection work really well for me. Color Effects Pro, I love. Pro Contrast, I dig. Right. Oh, best um, contrast. I'm in a the big business. Nick fan, actually. Pro Contrast. You. Um, I'll even I, I, use. I've I'll got, use I, Lu- Luminar for certain things, but I use Exposure. Okay. Mostly. So I, I want to ask kind of a two part question here, mm-hmm. and that is. For somebody who's never taken their photo to their iPad and worked on it in Procreate, which is a phenomenal app, and let's say they go buy a, a iPad Pro and they get an Apple Pencil and they bring a photo in, any quick tips for doing that for the first time? And two, any tips on the atmospheric, almost like uh, stuff floating in the air that you added here, any tips on blending that kind of overlay in? In on Procreate, you mean? Well, how, wherever, I don't know if you brought the overlay in of the, the atmospheric stuff. Did you do that in Procreate or Photoshop? I did a lot of it in Procreate. Um, okay. A Just lot the, of it, yeah. the blending. The way that you got, I'm guessing, did you create those or was that an overlay you, you bought somewhere? Or? The, the, the I'm sorry, the overlay, you mean what part? There's like this, this uh, not dust, but it's like small leaves and Brushes. So the leaves, they're all brushes. They're all brushes in Procreate and I did those by hand. Wow. Yeah, including wow. the dust. Okay, so any tip for somebody particles. doing Procreate type editing for the first time? Well, so, you know, go go to YouTube and pull up Procreate tutorials and just start seeing what's possible. But but you can import uh, an image. This is what got me going. Is somebody showed me how to use the blur tool in Procreate and a brush. And the brushes are, when I say brush, I mean, like, you can get all kinds of artistic brushes and stamps and you can do alcohol ink and watercolor and oil and all this stuff. You can literally take your photo if you want to and use the blur setting, choose your brush and you can brush on your image and the blurring kind of schmooze the pixels around and it starts to look like a painting. And of course, yes, there's technique involved in everything, but just try it. Just try that. And see see what it, where it takes you because that's what I did and I was like oh my gosh what does this do and it, the rest is history. <laughs> well, the results though. So as we're looking at this thing compositionally, was the light in the original photo? If you remember the original photo, how long ago was this? Do you know? So this was in two thousand seventeen. Okay. Was the light like I'm seeing it here? Or did you drastically change that in Procreate? Because the fact that it's not on the left, but on the right, and it's got that blue hue in there, very right. faint. So Did you do that? The light, so it was late in the afternoon. No, it was late in the afternoon, and it came in, and it was there. I, Since it was already there, I was able to sort of pick it up and kind of spread it. I didn't have to add too much. And then, and then it was good. I like, I, you know, I kind of stretched it as much as I could. And then I just kind of used an airbrush and just added just like at a really low opacity, like a 10% or a 5% opacity, just added a little bit here and there because it was there, but it felt like more like you go by the, you do this stuff by how it feels and what you want to convey and, you know, how you want to see it. So I, I love mystical light and I love mystical mists and I love you know, images with atmosphere. And when it comes to audio, you know, I like not pristine digital, but I like a more analog sound. So it always has a little hair on it. As it it should be, by the way. As it, well, thank you, analog guy. (laughs) Yeah. So my digital friends bore me and did strictly digital and everything's got to be crisp and clean. and, And I'm like, oh my God, I feel like I'm in handcuffs. So I do all kinds of things to, um, because how we see is not like that and how we feel isn't like that and how we respond is much more visceral. So I like my images to be visceral. So yes, and the light is. was there. Yes, there was a it, there was enough reflection that it looked like a mist. There wasn't an actual mist. I, I had to study it for a while myself. It was just that the angle at which the light came in kind of bounced and just expanded a bit, you know, down, you know, down toward the end there. And so I just grabbed that idea and and made more of it, not to the point of it becoming unlikely. I wanted it to tread that, like when you said in the beginning, you didn't know whether you know you didn't know whether to look at it as a photograph or a piece of art. I wanted to I wanted it to be on that line so a person would ask that question. And the truth is, it's both at the same time. 
Correct. And that's, that's what I That's really wanted. the answer is yeah. you've managed to, which is really difficult and really rare, you've managed to artify a photograph, mm -hmm. but leave the photograph in there. Correct. It, it, okay. It's this just really cool blend. And the other thing I notice here is, first of all, let me ask this. It just came to me. The fact that the trees in the far back are brighter than the ones in the middle, but then, you know, going down the path, but then on the left, they're bright green again. Did you change that shading or was the shading pretty accurate here? The shading was pretty accurate. I, you know, I heightened the parts that I wanted to be a little bit more, but the light, like I say, it was late in the afternoon and the light was coming through the trees and you can see where the light hits the road, but there was enough, enough of an opening that it did spill out onto the grass on the, on the left side beyond the trees. Um, I think I, as I recall, I brightened up the trees a little bit more because I said, oh my God, awesome. stick a light. Yeah. What would you do? What but it, you okay. Do? Here's the other thing talking about brightening. So mm -hmm. the bright spot behind the trees on the right and in the middle of the path is it's bright. It, yep. you know, you could call it the whitest part, brightest part of the image, but it's not 255. And there are areas in this shot that are definitely zero and there you're like 251 to 254 on a, on a on a range of 0 to 255. Your use of the full range of a histogram here mm -hmm. is is a huge part of what makes this shot work. Whether you do black and white or whether you do color, you have this tendency to make sure that the the intentional or not, I guess, to make sure that the entire spectrum is in there and you're not afraid to have black blacks you're not afraid to have white whites in there mm -hmm. if it fits you made the comment a second ago you know that that the people who you know look at film or, or digital and it's got to be perfect and excellent you know that you feel like you're in handcuffs like i'm trying to remember who made the quote i think it was vincent laferre or something to the effect i'm going to butcher this so folks go look it up <laughs> but it was something to the effect of art made um, in, I can't remember the phrasing, but it was something like art made based on what other people's opinions are, isn't art, it's bondage, right? Yeah. It's something to that effect. And that's what I see here, but you're shooting digital. Mm -hmm. You're shooting in a shot that has a ton of range. Mm -hmm. When you have a scene that's as dynamic as this mm -hmm. and you've got to choose, okay, there's going to be clipped highlights here no matter what, or there's going to be, you know, clipped pure blacks here no matter what. How do you choose that that balancing act, right? It's the art of uh, compromise photography, really. How do you choose what range you want to keep? Well, I want them all. I want everything. And I had it all. <laughs> I mean, let's face it, there's no, no, no uh, accident to the fact that everything's in an image because I want it all. I want to live this full life. I mean, these images reflect how I feel about living. So, you know, when you describe it, you're describing me. So how do I decide? I mostly try to um, shoot at a range like I know on Fujifilm. I had better, if I, if I want the detail in the high end, I'm going to expose more for that because I can bring the dark end up more easily than I can bring the light end down. It's pretty recoverable, the shadows and stuff on? Yeah, way more than my previous gear, which I won't talk about. But yes, I discovered it's like plasticine, these images, you know, what really? you can do with it. Yeah, yeah, it's just phenomenal. Plus, in camera also, this is the other thing I tend to do, is you can adjust the highlights and the, you know, like, so I might bring the highlights down and the shadows up in camera so that that range is already not so dramatic. And that's all real easy to do. Um, so I'll do things like that, you know, to, to get okay. the pixels and the range that I want to work with. Yeah. So if you were to give, because again, it's travel, it's landscape, it's macro, it's nature. You're, there was one shot that I, I really wanted, but it, th this was a better choice when I saw this one. But there was one shot that I saw of yours that... It's it's like a church on a hill. Oh yeah, Slovenia. And yeah. I look at these, and again, that goes back to what I said at the beginning. There's, it's minimalistic, but it draws your eye. But it uses, you know, for lack of a better advertising word, it uses white space, right? Mm -hmm. um, just oh man. So, in what you shoot, 
all the genres that you shoot. If you were to look at somebody that's looking at saying when where you were in the past, I want to get into photography. And specifically, I want to get into photography because I want to make fine art. Mm-hmm. Right? I'm curious of two tips. Number one, what's the technical tip that you would give them to be a better fine art photographer? Mm-hmm. The actual process, right? Mm-hmm. And two, what's the... I don't want to say mental process or business side, but do you know what I mean? What's the non holding the camera in your hand part that you would say to them would get them there quicker or closer? Wow. That's a whole show unto itself. Isn't okay, it? Though? It is. Okay. So <clears throat> one of the differentiating factors with fine art is fine art. First of all, <laughs> go try to find a definition of fine art. It's challenging. But right. consensus seems to be that fine art is more than like, I don't know what you call the other kind, but the general art. <laughs> I don't know. Not fine anyway, art. Yeah, I don't fi- know. Fine art, general art, fine art is it's all about the artist's point of view. So it's very specific. That could mean one su- that could mean one subject or two at the most, you know, within the frame. It is your opinion. And yours alone about that subject. It's an editorial. It's it's as it's as deep and as personal as you can make it because it's all about the artist and their point of view. So that's kind of the sort of the splitting. That's the outside the gear part. That's the um, outside the gear. That's inside the head. That's also inside the industry. Okay. So. It's always interesting to me when I, you know, for different projects have fine art people pick images versus, you know, when we're selling cameras, those also work, but we also have to make sure we get, you know, the big booming landscapes and the, you know, right, right. the tourist shots and all that kind of stuff, which are also important. I'm not playing those down. They're just different. You just got to know what you're aiming for. So fine art, first of all, is that. So then in, what was your second question? The, the technical side, is there anything when they're standing in this location with hopefully a Fujifilm camera in their hand, <laughs> right? What, what tip would you give them to get the shot? Technically. That's your question? Or mentally, I guess it could go either way. Okay. So- at that point, when you're standing there, there's a, there's a technical part to what's in your head too. Right. So let's say- I'm not sure if this shot is a good example. I'm not sure if this is going to be strong enough, but I'm going to give it a shot. So let's say I'm standing there, you know, at my height and here's my eyes and I'm looking at this scene and I go, oh, this is so beautiful. This is going to look really great. And typically people would go snap. That's a snapshot, you know, then, okay, then let's say I'm shooting for Fujifilm and I really want it to really pop. You know, I might use a film simulation to get it, you know, even further along in camera. And, and then, you know, and then I think of different angles and so on and so forth, where it starts to move into fine art is when I go from what will show off the camera in my case, um, what will get people's imagination going? Like that's all thinking about what they will want to where does this land for me? What, what is this saying to me and what, where do I position my camera? Cause in this case it was, you know, pretty close to the road, if not on the road, I think I had a, yes, I, I should have mentioned that it's a very low angle of attack. Yeah. Yeah. So, so fine art is about your point of view. So my point of view about what took that scene in and made it go <gasps> for me, because I always look for that reaction that always tells me I'm on the right track was dropping it down to the ground including just so much, you know, the right amount of the trees and making sure that it was wide enough to encompass that light, which was a huge feature. Um, And then it became my point of view versus, you know, cool road. A snapshot. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with snapshots. I'm not saying that, but these are some of the differentiating factors in creating an image that's one way or the other, because, you know, commercial photographers have to go and show off the car if they're a car photographer or, you know, get the clothing on the model just right because it, you're shooting for the clothing manufacturer or what have you, you know, fine art, you're, you're shooting for yourself. You're also shooting for an audience, but it depends upon you getting your 
point of view is strong enough and, and across enough. And, you know, this encompasses my whole philosophy of life and light and, you know, the powers to be. When I saw this shot, this shot in and of itself, right? This kind of summarized up that quote, photographer, voice, and in this case, photographic voice and purveyor of awesomeness. Just That's amazing. So, so before, before we finish up, I've got a question for you because yeah. you know everybody. Uh, this will probably be actually very difficult for you. But if there, were, if there were one photographer that people don't know about that people should really go look up, who's that photographer? Oh, my God. Uh, I'm horrible with names. So I'm going to fail miserably on this. Um, there is no failure. <laughs> Young weed hopper. It sounded uh, so Star Trek or Star Wars. I know. There is no failure. There is just do. Gosh, there are just so many. Um, and Who's I, a photographer and I, that inspires you? You know, the thing of it is, there are so many amazing photographers. But what true? if I'm really honest in answering that question, I get my biggest inspiration from painters, from the powers that be from light from um and if i and if i it, as far as art forms go i have to say from from painters both fantastical kinds like uh, vladimir kush who's one of my favorites as well as the um landscape masters you know over the ages right there's so, so really uh, it's a study of of traditional use of light then it's a blend of a traditional use of light as if you painted it and f a fantastical way of seeing the world all in one frame. I love your outlook. I just love your <laughs> outlook. Uh, again, thank you so much. Before we go, I, I want everybody to know how to find you. And if you're watching the video version, either in the podcast feed or on YouTube, Lower thirds have popped up under Karen as we've been talking, but I want to give these out. You have two different websites. I have three. Uh, one actually, for your photography, two, one for two, your. Okay. Two for art and one as a like a portal. Get, let's do all three of them. All right. So you what want me to do that now? <laughs> yeah. So um, my photography, just the photography uh, artwork is at karenhuttonphotography.com. My digital art, which, as I told you, I started the end of last year and it just turned into something. So I decided to make it, give it a website. So that is at karenhutton.art. That's where this photo we've talked about today or this piece of art is. And then karenhutton.com is where my voiceover is and all my teaching and my media page and all that kind of thing is there. And uh, so that's kind of like my admin I guess. Yeah, it's kind probably. of the central place for, yeah. for you. So, yeah, and you can get to all the other places from there too. What about uh, social media? I know that you have two Facebook. You have a, a personal profile and a page, correct? Correct, correct. I, I you know, I probably chat more on the, the profile. Um, I think I use my Facebook profile page and Instagram the most, and I kind of fire things out from there to my Facebook page and Twitter. And then Twitter and Instagram are easy. It's at Karen Hutton. So that makes it easier. The book so that you know, uh, 10 steps to finding your voice. You can look that up. Where can they get that? Is that on Amazon or? That is not on Amazon. It's actually just on my karenhutton.com. It's just an ebook. Okay. And yeah, you can order it directly from there. It's super simple. I've got some in the works, but I've been so busy. I just haven't been able to stop but that's next up on my list is more books so 10 steps to finding your voice is the book and then you also have two classes i didn't mention this earlier and i should have but you actually have two classes at kelby one uh how to infuse you all caps i love that how to infuse you into your photography and that really that summarizes this whole conversation should have just yeah. started there and then you also have Finding Your Artistic Voice. Again, just right. think about those titles, and it really wraps around everything that we have done. So again, Karen, thank you so much for this. I, I'm so excited that I had you on. This is very, my mother was excited she had me too. I'm sorry, I had to get that out of my head or else I couldn't finish by saying thank you for having me on the show. 
Um, it's a real honor and it's a real joy to talk about this kind of stuff because it's a place I would love to see more people reach into, into their artistic muse and free themselves to see what's next for them. Yeah. I just, I, when I started the show, it was just like, I just want to interview a photograph and learn about them from the photograph. And this is the example I need to have you on now with one of your regular photographs too. We need to do that sometime. <laughs> okay. So to everybody, just a reminder, you can go to the website. It's behind the TV. Find the link for this episode. And there's a blurb that I wrote there about Karen and all the links to everything that we've mentioned, all her social media, websites, book, all of that, classes on Cubby One. Those links are all there as well, as well as a small gallery uh, that kind of shows you a sample of her work. But in truth, just go to her portfolio or the two of them and look at the fine art and look at the photography stuff. And again, uh, thank you very much. And I do want to remind you that if you want to get in on the critique shows, I'm doing those right now. Once a month with my buddy Don Komarechka, and we stream those live to the Behind the Shot YouTube channel. So go subscribe to Behind the Shot on YouTube, click the bell so that you're notified when we go live. And if you want to participate, all you got to do is go over to Flickr, sign up for a Flickr account, free or paid, doesn't matter. Join the Behind the Shot group and then just start sharing your pictures in there. Now, at that point, you're just playing in the pool, being part of the community, as it were. If you want your shots to be considered for the critique shows, add a Flickr tag, B. T.S. Critique, all one word. And that's what we search for. That's like your permission. Like, I'm okay if you, you know, talk about my image on the show. And that's kind of basically what that is. Uh, also, quick reminder as well, new remote learning class coming up in April. It's going to be three nights over three consecutive weeks. Uh, new remote learning class at Princeton Photo Work Workshops. It's PrincetonPhotoWorkshop.com. You can get all the information there, and I hope to see you during that class. It's going to be fun. It's live. It's remote. You don't have to travel anywhere during COVID, and we're going to have a lot of fun. I've got homework for you to do and all kinds of stuff. So that wraps it up for this episode of Behind the Shot. I'm Steve Brazel. If you ever want to reach out to me, feel free to do so on social media. And until then, we'll see you on the next show. 